All right, thank you, Omar. Um, so yes, um, hi, I'm Matt Bitchkovsky, and I'm a security engineer at Square. Um, and today I would like to talk about the, uh, about the process of implementing Spiffy um, at Square. So I'll touch on service identity at Square, you know, why we decided to use Spiffy, why Spire. Um, I would like to, you know, briefly get into the migration process, how it looked, uh, how did it look for us? And finally, any learnings that we had from, from the whole um, um, project. So Square, you know, might not be well known outside of US, but a lot of people recognize us as the little white reader for taking payments. Um, but uh, Square has seen a tremendous growth over the years. So as many other companies, we started from a monolith and these days we're kind of getting close to a thousand services running in production. We're like in different regions around the world and so on. Um, so once we got more than one service, we needed to make the service calls secure. And, you know, a long time ago, someone decided to use mutual TLS. Uh, since there weren't many apps, uh, because as you can imagine, you have a monolith, you start building new services, maybe break off a little bit of that functionality or build something totally on the side. Uh, so you just have a few apps, right? So um, you can just manually issue certificates, um, client certificates, and then you can distribute them manually to the host that you have. Probably your infrastructure is not massive. Uh, so you can mostly do it by hand or using some scripts. Uh, but eventually, as we were growing more services and more hosts, it was you know kind of becoming brittle. Um, so we needed a better way to manage sensitive material. Um, so we built Kiwis. Uh, it's a project that we later open sourced. And um, Kiwis, uh, basically what it does, it stores and distributes secrets to all the hosts. And then once we had that, um, we also had to look into authorization. So again, at some point, someone wrote authorization code and added that to a common framework. And you know, this common framework or a library would be used by other applications, other services at Square. Um, and the way it was done actually was that, you know, um, there was some code that would, uh, basically we encoded the, um, the application name in part of the certificate. And for that, we specifically picked the organizational unit, part of the subject field. Um, everyone just calls it OU at Square. Um, and then there's this common framework that would, you know, get the client certificate, would parse it, extract the identity, and based on that, would perform some checks. Um, and then, you know, we kept iterating on that. And then eventually, um, some of the scripts that were still left to orchestrate the certificate issuance and just using keywords and so on, uh, we turned that into a more cohesive service with an API, just sort of like a um, orchestrator, uh, if you like. Uh, so. You know, if you kind of think about this, this we have the CA, we have Kiwis, we have some other services. It started looking a little bit like maybe what you would get with Spire in terms of, you know, issuing identity system. So now the question is, why would we want Spiffy? We have this something that seems to be working well for us. And, um, you know, the, the big part of our service identity system where it kind of comes short is it's tied to Kiwis and it's tied to our on-prem uh, architecture. So, you know, we don't use Kubernetes, we have our own data centers, we have bare metal and so on. And um, if we wanted to take this, say, to the cloud or any other places, um, you know, then we would have to, you know, it would have to come with keywords. So we would have to build all those different things that we have uh, in order to bring the service identity with us. And one of the big things that we had in past couple of years was that we've had a growing adoption of cloud services at Square. And it wasn't just that you know, we wanted to use cloud, but we had to because we had to keep up with our growth. And finally, you know, when you have this kind of situation comes up, it's kind of an opportunity for you to really start questioning status quo and being like, hey, do we have like, you know, as our system that we've built, is it best? Does it serve us the best these days? Or is there something else that we can do and look for the future? Um, and then once we settled on Spiffy, the next thing is like, how do we implement it? Of course we could roll our own, but we already done it once and we didn't want to just, you know, build our service identity again. And, you know, we had to look at Spire and we started looking at it like probably around two years ago. So Spire was still like very early on as a project, uh, but it already had a lot of features uh, that we cared about. And I think one of the uh, biggest thing for us was um, it had, pluggable architecture, right? So like, it was great because it came with lots of plugins, but for anything that was custom for us that we'd have to build, we could extend it. 
And of course, Envoy support, it meshes really well with Envoy. So again, we're using Envoy service mesh at Square, at least we're uh, rolling it out. So again, another great thing for us um, that would work out of the box. Okay, so let's have a look at the migration process. Uh, so first we had to deploy Spire servers to our on-prem. And then we had, um, once we had that, we had of course Spire agent, one Spire agent running on each host, kind of like a daemon set situation. And this really was a place where we can iron out any sort of like, you know, small issues here and there. You know, we did run into some problems or some missing feature that you don't even know you need it until you get stuff up and running. And a lot of this was like early on, I would say Spire 0 0.6, 0 0.7 era. So it's probably like where, at least a year ago or a year and a half. Um, so I think Spire has come a long way and all those features that, you know, we might have not had then, we have now. Um, so yeah, so once we have it running up and it was kind of dormant state, the next thing was to, um, you know, start um, registering entries in Spire such that we can start issuing identities. So we had to build some workload registrar because that's usually a custom thing, especially if you have a custom stack. And um, another thing we did, we started populating that with, with like actual applications, actual identities that we had in our system. And we slowly were trickling that until we get to 100%. So all of our production application, all of the services are, are registered in Inspire. And then we got to the point where we had like over a thousand, um, hundred thousand, entries and we could rotate certificates and we can you know play with configs and seeing like how spire performs does the rotations and everything and none of those uh, identities were used by production workloads yet but we could already see um, a great deal of information from that so then once we had that uh, we wanted to make sure that it, spire could be hooked into envoy or envoy could you know call up to spire agent uh, since we have a custom control plane we had to run some modifications a little bit there to the config and maybe made a change to initial kind of config that comes with the sidecar, but nothing too drastic, especially that the SDS API uh, was implemented by Spire agent. So once we had that, uh, then we're getting close and uh, well, there's another catch. It's like, okay, how do you make sure that all the sort of services, all the applications that are in production, how can they understand those new identities? And this is where we um, had, I, as I mentioned before, we had the authorization logic and for, for, for historical reason, it lived in the common framework. So in the library and it was in each supported language. So we had Go, Ruby and Java. And um, you know we had to figure out how to make sure that those applications understand spiffy IDs, because as I mentioned before, we had this internal way of looking at identities. And um, we had to kind of wrangle the code a little bit to make sure we had some backwards compatibility there. Um, and I think it's especially important because we had ACLs, so you know, access control list, and, and it was in a code base of each application and it was calling out the application name, but now you can get spiffy ID. So we had to figure out how to do it without making lots of changes or make it hard on app owners to be, you know, could, so that they could adopt spiffy. Um, and then final step, once we had all of that done and updated, uh, was to really, you know, start using spiffy IDs. And for that, uh, we built feature flags into uh, the Envoy control plane. And then we had a real, really fast way of switching to spiffy and back. So like any new connection connecting to a particular Envoy sidecar could be using spiffy uh, certificates. And then you could just, you know, switch the feature flag back and then go back to the homegrown certificates. So now that was, uh, that was quite a lot to digest probably, uh, but here are some of the things that we learned from this project. Uh, we were planning for like a solid year of work, but it ended up being even more than that for us for various reasons. A lot of it being, um, we just have lots of custom um, implement, a lot of custom implementations. So we don't use like Kubernetes and that sort of thing. So that definitely delayed um, a lot of the, you know, stuff for us. And of course, we also started early on with Spire. So again, going back a little bit like year and a half or so. So, you know, you're still trying to figure out how do you map this new system onto something that you know really well, but it's very specific to you. Um, so if anything, I would say, yeah, um, you know, manage your expectations and, you know, make sure you staff your project accordingly and you have people who are dedicated to this project and not necessarily get distracted by your other day-to-day uh, -day things. Um, so, you know, the days might be long, but they're shorter when you get help. So uh, I just cannot say 
enough of good things about Spiffy Slack, super helpful, lots of smart people, a great place to bounce off ideas, brainstorm, people who've done this before in other companies. Uh, so you're not alone. Um, you know, you don't, again, with Spire and open source, and this is a great point of open source, you don't have to build everything yourself. Um, you know, you can chip in features, uh, but others can make it better. Um, you know, you can share the burden of maintenance because obviously maintenance is, is a big part of, of products um, in, in order to, you know, keep them stable. It takes a lot of work after you actually implement features. So um, I think this is a, a big, big plus for Spire and having this robust community. So, you know, another thing that we learned is you want to, you do want to learn early and often, um, but you want to keep your risk acceptable. And that's sort of what I mean when I say take principled risks. Um, so you don't want to end up in a situation where you're going to production with a small subset of your platform and then you realize that you can't scale to all the nodes maybe, uh, which by the way, wasn't the case with Spire. It's been, it's been working really well for us in that sense. Um, so another thing you don't want to just like um, switch low um, throughput services um, to use um, say Spiffy and then you find out later like, oh, it doesn't work with some high you know, throughput and highly critical applications. Um, so because of that, we kind of uncover a couple of things. For example, we run into some database performance issue once we, you know, enable it for all our workloads and we are running it in shadow mode. Um, but because we had, you know, telemetry and internal DB metrics, we could share that with, uh, you know, the Spire core team. And uh, we actually got help uh, on that. And, um, you know, they managed to, I guess, shave the performance by at least a half, if not more, it was, it was amazing. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was working well for us. But again, uh, you don't want to yellow things. You want to, you know, uh, take risks, but, uh, you know, pace yourself with that. Um, so if you want to have this adoption, and I think some people already mentioned this, you want to have backwards compatibility. You can just, you know, greenfield this and just hope for the best. Um, product teams, um, you know, there are migrations happening all the time. There's infrastructure changes, like, you know, someone brings new logging, there's new like service mesh, there are other things and product teams just don't have time for that. Uh, you need to focus on like, you know, developing features and uh, you won't be bogged down by another, yet another infrastructure migration. So you want to make this process smooth. What it meant for us is that uh, we added, uh, for example, DNS names to the Spiffy certificates it's because our homegrown certificates had DNS name as a way to validate. Um, so then if Spiffy IDs had the same set of, um, you know, DNS names, then you can start doing things where you could sort of mix uh, those certificates on a connection where you have a client that's still on the homegrown certificate and then the server being on a Spiffy certificate and you can have a nice TLS handshake and you can gradually, um, you know, you can gradually opt into Spiffy rather than being in a lock step where it's getting really complicated as you have lots of upstream and downstream dependencies. So the actual mesh of your services can get really complicated once you have a lot of them in production. And of course we had to add the, uh, we had to share the trust bundle. So we had to do some work to make sure that we did kind of like, you know, fake federation between um, Spire and um, our own homegrown system as a way to serve sort of get into Spiffy ID, spread it everywhere, and hopefully start removing the homegrown identities as we go. Um, right, and when you build this backwards compatibility, um, I think you want to define limits on that because at some point um, you have, um, you know, the law of diminishing returns, you have migrations having long tail, um, some apps will get decommissioned before you get to them. So maybe you shouldn't even bother building support for that. Um, I think cutting scope is, is you know, true of any project. And what it meant for us, for example, was we had the Envoy service mesh that was taking off. Maybe we had at some point like you know, 50 or 100 apps using it. And I, I'm talking apps, I mean services, but we keep calling them apps at Square. So I'll keep, you know, probably interchange the words. Um, and, and then we said like, okay, why don't we just start with Envoy service mesh first and ignore everything else? So any sort of direct TLS connections between services, we can just keep them as, as is and don't break them. 
uh, hopefully don't break them. And, and then what it meant is like, okay, we're working out our Spire deployment, we're going to production and we're going through different you know, motions. And it, in, in the meantime, the service Envoy Mesh had some you know, attractive features for engineers. So they were adopting this Envoy service mesh quite a lot. So then we still have a, more and more uh, apps that we can opt into Spiffy without even looking at the long tail. And you know, once the time comes, we will look into it, but um, until then, uh, we can ignore the problem and just, um, you know, look at the top of uh, the pro top priority. Um, so, you know, now again, talking about how you expand Spiffy is like, how do you convince folks that they, they should use this new and better system? And, and sadly, you know, security is not necessarily the best selling point when you tell people like, oh, do this because it's secure. Uh, you know, people may not upgrade, but you have some new emojis and, and all of a sudden you have a great adoption rate. So, um, you know, if you can bundle those features somehow, that's, I think that's really helpful. And um, unfortunately we missed the Envoy service mesh. If we were about to go with like, for example, this, you know, this new service mesh and we could from day one say like, oh, the service mesh is coming with Spiffy, then actually it would be great for us. But we kind of missed this, uh, um, this uh, you know, bundle this train, this release trains, and then, you know, we have to kind of uh, do it ourselves. Um, and this kind of brings me to the next point, which is like you either, you know, can uh, get others to do the migration for you and, or you have to do it yourself. And, and this kind of goes back a little bit to the bundling is if the engineers have good reason uh, to upgrade, they will do it and then the work is done. But in order for that to happen, um, you need to have documentation in place. You have to make it really easy uh, for someone to, you know, uh, do it themselves. And we had this ex this one example where uh, we were launching this um, Kubernetes cloud cluster, and um, you know there were some features that people wanted to do or people wanted to deploy to the cloud for various reasons, and uh, they also had to call back to on-prem. So uh, the new Kubernetes clusters was running, uh, it was using Spiffy from day one, because again, new shiny thing, you know, use the latest tech stack, it's great. Uh, but then you still had to somehow call in back to the data center applications. And then for that, you had to be Spiffy compatible. But because people had the need for using the cloud, they had no problem opting into Spiffy. And the way we designed this whole system was that we built some, you know, some CLI tools. So you can see like, hey, am I Spiffy compatible? Yes, you are. Okay, here's a feature flag, add your app name and off you go. And we've seen actually a pretty good adoption people doing that, even though it's still early on for the cloud cluster we've been running. Um, so infrastructure is in a constant slow state of degradation and it takes work to keep it flexible. Um, and what was true yesterday might not be true today. Um, some of the things we've seen, and, and this just keeps probably popping up in, in systems where you know our certificates, our homegrown identities were exposed as files, um, so, you know, they're available to your app, then maybe you run a new process in your pod or something like that. And you're like, oh, I can use those certificates. Great. So now I can use them outside of framework for some, some stuff that we don't even know we're using it. Like, you know, maybe you pre like keep the identity of this app, but you have a, some site process that will call another app and we don't even uh, may not know about that, that, you know, there's such use case, right? Um, then frameworks parse certificates. This is, ha this happened early on where, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, the certificate, the client certificate is exposed to the framework, to the library. So you do some parsing, there's some code, someone wrote it in Java, uh, but then maybe someone brings a new language at some point, again, in some corner, uh, there's a need for, I don't know, doing stuff in Python, right? And then um, people be like, okay, how do I make it work with other services? Now I need to get the call and they look at the code and it's like, oh, I would just copy this code and roughly replace that you know, in a different language. Uh, but then there's small differences and then you get into problems with that. Um, so then, you know, we introduced Envoy Service Mesh. It started terminating TLS and you have this, you know, plain text connection over Unix socket to the, uh, to the application. But because so much code still relies on the client certificate, now you're forwarding the client certificates to the app uh, rather than just maybe passing some spiffy ID in a header or something else. So again, it kind of takes time to uh, clean this up and you have to uh, consciously kind of take the effort to make those changes. Otherwise you end up, um, you know, in the situation in this uh, slow uh, degradation. So, you know, people get used to 
uh, people get used to the way that things are and you need to challenge those assumptions if you want to make, uh, if you want to change things. Um, so I already mentioned how, you know, folks parsing certificates later, they are want to parse the PIDs uh, because some of the trust domains are not intuitive anymore. And then we have those ACLs and ACLs only has the application name. And as you hopefully can see on the slide, it's either, you know, application name, my app, or you have this spiffy construct, this URI, where it's like, I don't know what those trust domains are. Um, so, you know, that's kind of confusing. Um, another thing where, you know, people might have mental models, it's like, oh, we have staging and we have production. If I allow my app to app A to call app B, uh, then that means it's good for staging and production. But it might not be really true in, you know, once you have more trust domains in with you know, Spiffy ID, we have more trust domains. We have staging production on-prem, we have a dev staging production cloud, and then we have like a separate one for Lambda, and then it just keeps growing. So, you know, it's not the same. So you definitely need to educate and promote uh, within the company. Um, I mean, obviously true of the project in general in the, in, in the broader tech community, but definitely true internally as well. Um, then short-lived certificates are great <laughs> until they're not. Uh, and this is probably a nightmare scenario you want to avoid. You don't want to get in a, in a place where like all your certificates expire um, and you may not have a lot of time. And some of this is, is totally how Square did it. Um, our certificates were over a one year lifetime before uh, the homegrown identity. So, you know, we had different monitoring systems that, you know, if you tripped all those different tracks, even in the worst case, you should have get to the few days where you can respond by Friday and be like, okay, I can get to it. Uh, but if your SVITs are at 24 hour TTL, then, you know, and you refresh them at half of the lifetime, then you may end up with like, you know, up to 12 hours to fix some issues. Um, of course, there are different uh, failure scenarios and we were actually running some exercises. And I would also say the 24 hour TTL, it's purely what Square chose. And um, it's definitely beneficial for us in many ways. And um, Spire has been actually really, really good about uh, the rotations. And even, you know, a year ago, we have not had really issues with uh, that logic. So, uh, so kudos to the design and implementation because it's been um, working really well. Um, and I know I said I had 10 lessons, but, uh, you know, I couldn't resist it to uh, turn it up to 11. Um, so it definitely can be challenging at times to solve production identity problems, but it's much easier when you're facing them as a team. So I just want to say many thanks to my team, security infrastructure, who made this project the breeze, and of course, uh, you know, the broader Spiffy Inspire community. If any of that sounds interesting, you should come uh, talk to me. Uh, so thank you. And uh, I don't know if there are any questions, but happy to answer. Matt, you, you glossed over an important yet often overlooked point around staffing appropriately. Uh, what's, what's your take on what's the, the right size crew for a surgical team to be effective around Spire? I imagine a, a good you know, pizza size crew would be, would be great. I guess it depends on your needs. Uh, one of the things that we've done at Square that uh, was was kind of helpful was that we actually had three people at, at a time working on this, right? And um, that was really good. But the problem we've done is we kind of ended up with swim lanes that one person was looking at some AWS cloud. I was looking at on-prem and someone else was looking at AWS native. Uh, we were looking into building MTLS into Lambda. So we ended up, you know, very much separated. And I think that in hindsight, it would have been great if we just build more focus on um, just tackling one problem at a time and not paralyzing that and having that sort of like a shared knowledge. Because what happened later is my team is more like, um, you know, six, seven people. So we actually own other things, not just, uh, you know, service, like our homegrown service identity. So later you had to go and also like educate the rest of your team because they've been just busy doing other stuff. So, you know, you kind of end up in the situation where um, you should definitely uh, involve more people. I would say three people sounds about right to me, depending on the size of your project. That's Great guidance, thank you. Uh, quick question from the chat. I think this is a straightforward answer. Your topology around multi-cluster and federation, correct me if wrong, Square deals with a single trust domain for all the infrastructure. Is that correct? You do single not use trust. federation. Mm, 
um, Federation. Right. So Federation, we're not using Federation yet. And, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky. We want to build Federation next year. But the way we, we do it is we have different data centers. So staging is one trust domain. Uh, different, different, say, data centers in staging are, trust, uh, are one trust domain. We have, like, say, three production on-prem data centers. They're one trust domain. So we have separate clusters, but um, they're under one trust, considered one trust domain. Uh, Actually, they're, they're backed by, production is backed by one database. That's why you have the same trust bundle. Um, and then we also have uh, cloud and cloud is um, like one trust domain configured, but like separate uh, registration for each cluster. So they're kind of disconnected. So the way we've done it to solve this problem is we essentially ended up sharing routes manually and putting them in a trust bundle, which eventually we want to move into the federation. But this was sort of like, um, like a short-term fix until we go to the point where, um, you know, we can build a whole federation. I don't know if that answers the, the question. I believe it does. Thank you for yeah. a great presentation. That was a wealth of knowledge packed all together in one. You also yeah. went the best plush in your, in your room setup. Mm -hmm. I, I had Thank to you. change my virtual background to reciprocate. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>